Lash Lore, a company was selling a mascara that would make women blind, and it took a toll to the point where it made its way up to the White House. Um, and then they started really passing a few laws back there in 1938, um, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, but it never held any real weight moving forward. And, you know, it had some, um, you know, reasonable recommendations, but it did not, which is the key issue, it did not require testing of, in, of chemicals before they go into our food products believe it or not, or cosmetics or cleaning products. So in this country, we really have a bias towards manufacturing companies. We're all about free trade and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, the American dream and prosperity and invention. And, you know, that really has taken a toll because we are creating things and putting things into products and onto the market that are not required this very simple requirement of making sure it's safe for human uh, skin or consumption before it goes into those products. I'm pissed. I'm pissed as a doctor. I'm 47. I'm in medicine and I'm just beside myself that we're not teaching patients and consumers and other doctors, you know, what, what the science shows internationally about how diet, nutrition, air quality, cosmetics do to the human body. Welcome to the Live Damn Well podcast. My name is Jorge Roman, and my guest today is Dr. Ailey Cohen, a triple board certified physician in internal medicine, rheumatology, and integrative medicine. She's also a trained specialist in environmental health, having recently co authored the guidebook, Non Toxic Guide to Living Healthy in a Chemical World, where she dives deep into the research on the effects of modern toxins on our health. Dr. Cohen is working to educate and empower the next generation to make safer, smarter lifestyle choices through the creation of environmental health and prevention curricula for schools nationwide. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Jorge. This is a pleasure. So as I understand it, there are very few triple board certified physicians. And so that's kind of a big deal for people that don't know that. So why did you decide to learn from so many different fields? And then why did you decide to study toxins? Well, you know, I always follow my interests. So my original interest was to go through internal medicine, which is a requirement to do any other subspecialty, whether it's cardiology or uh, rheumatology, which is my, my other specialty, um, or, you know, pulmonology. Um, so you have to do that. So then board certified there. And then um, I went on to do, um, so internal medicine is a board certification, rheumatology is a board certification. And then you know, many years later, after I had my kids, I was still interested. I'm a chronic learner, um, and I wanted to find out about integrative medicine, which is how the, um, you know, a holistic approach to healing, because I was kind of getting exhausted from doling out medications in every, you know, visit I had with patients, which is really how the Western medicine world is set up. It's not about prevention, it's about treatment, of disease. And my goal was, you know, well, why are we treating when we could be preventing? Why can't we look into the things, the ancient remedies that have been around thousands of years, acupuncture, Ayurvedic medicine, supplements that are made from herbs that have been around for thousands of years that have legitimate, wonderful studies, you know, regarding them. So basically the long and the short of it is, is that I did these at a pace that I felt was aligned with my interests my finances, because you have to actually pay for some of these programs outside of your conventional med school payments, which is out, you know, outrageous. Um, and then really, it was just a matter of creating a toolbox that I could help heal people with not just one set of tools, but multiple. So the, the way I got into environmental medicine, so for your audience, just to give a definition of what environmental medicine is, environmental medicine or environmental health is really how our environment plays a key role in human health. And that can include, you know, food chemicals and food quality, like processed foods or healthy foods. It can include water contamination. It can include stress. It can include poor sleep, which is lifestyle based. It can include uh, noise pollution, uh, synthetic light. It can include, um, you know, air quality. So in other words, it's how the environment plays a role on human health. That's the broad topic. Um, the way I got into environmental health, because I didn't even know what that was, uh, about eight or nine years ago, was that my dog, who is this gorgeous golden retriever, um, about four and a half years of age, um, uh, he became sick. 
And I didn't know why. And we just figured he'd swallowed a sock or something else that golden retrievers do. They eat everything. So we took him to the vet. And at that time, it turns out that he had a liver the size of a golf ball, which for a normal healthy dog is ridiculous. That's about a third or even a fourth of what a, a liver should be uh, in terms of size. And so what we were told was that he had uh, autoimmune hepatitis, which is when the body's immune system uh, attacks itself, uh, and in his case, with the liver. So humans get autoimmune hepatitis as well when their immune system is triggered for some reason, usually environmental. Um, and we just could not believe that this dog had gotten so sick um, with such a rare diagnosis in dogs, but particularly golden retrievers. And so um, I started looking up out of sadness and my heartbreaking, he was my firstborn, right? Um, you know, anything that could have caused him to, to be in this situation, what, was it the dog food we were feeding him? Contamination, was there, was there drinking water contamination in his water bowl? Was there pesticide issues, maybe even his flea and tick collar? He also had this red plastic toy that he always was sucking on and chewing on so that he wouldn't eat the siding off of our house. Um, and this is a popular dog toy. We couldn't figure out if that might have triggered his immune system in terms of the chemicals. So long and short of it is as I was looking for answers for my dog, um, I started opening a Pandora's box of information about how little we are regulated in this country in terms of chemicals that affect human health particularly babies and children and prenatal exposure. And it just really blew my mind. And I had to sit in my kitchen looking around at my dog and my cat and going, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And finally having checked all this, um, you know, these questions with real resources and environmental groups and physicians that were involved in this type of work, it just blew my mind and I knew I had to get into this for the rest of my life in terms of telling others and teaching doctors and teaching high school students and everyone about how we can do this better. I know in, uh, in terms of the research that's going on in electromagnet, electromagnetism, um, like such as things like 5G, cell phones, Wi-Fi radiation, like it's, it's like proven it's it's safe it's considered safe until proven not safe which is the opposite of what any new thing any new chemical any new technology should be and you know that's really the problem and most people will think that it is already safe it has undergone proper testing um you know unbiased testing and you know in many cases that's that's not really the case so like why do you think that is is that just like a conflict of interest or yeah, I think that, you know, it, it, it's, it dates very far back to the poor legislation back from the 1930s when it came to testing cosmetics. You know, women used to try out eyelash liner, and it's in my book, the story of how Lash Lore, a company, was selling a mascara that would make women blind, um, and it took a toll to the point where it made its way up to the White House, and there was a letter written by one woman's daughter to the president. Um, and then they started really passing a few laws back there in 1938, um, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, but it never held any real weight moving forward. And, you know, it had some, um, you know, reasonable recommendations, but it did not, which is the key issue, it did not require testing of, in, of chemicals before they go into our food products, uh, believe it or not, or cosmetics or cleaning products. So, in this country, we really have a bias towards manufacturing companies. We're all about free trade and, 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 and um, you know, uh, the American dream and prosperity and invention. And, you know, that really has taken a toll because we are creating things and putting things into products and onto the market that are not required this very simple requirement of making sure it's safe for human uh, skin or consumption before it goes into those products. For instance, proprietary um, combinations like the word fragrance or, or perfume. If you look at a label on fabric softener or laundry detergent, or you look at a cosmetic or a cleaning product that says perfume or fragrance, that word can have up to 300 or more chemicals that you will never know or be allowed to know what is in that word in the terms of those 300 or more chemicals because propri it's proprietary. It's like the, the formula or recipe for Coca-Cola. That's insane. So it biased towards manufacturing. They are protected. And in fact, if you have a cosmetic on, you know, you buy in the store and it makes your hair fall out or your teeth fall out or a major rash, the FDA um, does not have the right, our government does not have a right to pull that from 
store shelves. It has to be the manufacturing company that actually voluntarily takes that off the shelf. And are those fragrances individually tested? No, no. So there's a, I mean, the only way we know that there's problems is because third party groups like university level research bodies, international research bodies have shared their work in terms of testing these chemicals. And, uh, um, and so these are people who are salaried. They're not making money off of necessarily sussing out what's in each individual product. Um, and it costs lots of money. These are, these are very expensive studies. And so this is why it's so complicated to keep going after each of the 90,000 chemicals that we now have in our market used for everything we love. And so to go after each one is really a complicated task. And what we need to really see is whether or not the legislation will ever turn towards requiring that very safe, that very important um, safe rule, which would be to have it tested um, in children, in pre-pregnant women, or at least better animal studies, which is not required before they go into the market. Right. As, as you were saying, with Western medicine, the focus is really symptom-based treatment. So we're really focusing on the effects rather than the causes. And that has profound imp implications for how we view disease. And so um, we've really only recently began to see this progressive change in the ideology, although a lot of the allopathic medical paradigm is still very resistant to like environmental stressors and, and their importance. So why do you think that is? Why aren't more health professionals on board with the idea of like toxins? Well, I think going back to just nutrition, let's start even more basic than that. Like most of us, most, you know, reasonable people know that nutrition makes a difference in human health, even at just a very broad level. Well, in medical schools today, literally today, 2020, um, on average, there are five hours of nutrition training given to medical school students over the course of a four-year medical school. So wow. it's absurd, five hours in four years when we know instinctively, if not even what our mothers told us, right? We know instinctively that food makes a difference in human health, whether it's saturated fats that cause elevated um, lipids, whether it's processed foods um, that can lead to all sorts of, you know, issues, even migraines like mine did. Um, you know, we know that there are so many health benefits and health limitations to the what we eat. And I would also argue what we drink, which is another big topic I talk about, which is drinking water that people don't pay much attention to and really just assume that our water is so clean. Um, and so all these things that we're ingesting on such a regular basis adds up to problems and adds up to health issues. And that is what we're trying to highlight, myself and my co-author, Dr. Bamsal, in this book, Non-Toxic, Guide to Living Healthy in a Chemical World, is to really teach people what the problem is, what these chemicals have been shown to do, which we can talk about, and then most importantly, what we all can do about it. It's not about freaking people out and saying, see ya. It's about telling people the real story so that they can own it and be empowered and not wait for the legislation or medical schools to teach their doctors so that their doctors give us two minutes literally on diet and nutrition if they're lucky. You know, it's just the healthcare system is not set up for more than 15 minute appointments. And, and really these doctors don't feel qualified or trained to, to even discuss nutrition, um, which is a real shame and a missed op opportunity. So we yeah. have to do it for ourselves. We have to be empowered, I believe, as, a, as you're doing, as you're trying to teach people as well, is that you can't wait for others. You need to find out good vetted information and then know exactly what you can do to lower that kind of chemical burden in your body. Yeah, because I really think there's a sort of facade of scientific certainty that goes on. And, you know, we really don't know all there is to know. And even like, like people who are doctors who are incredibly knowledgeable people, they don't have all of the answers. And that doesn't come down to their intelligence. That just comes down to what they were, how they were educated in med school. That's, that's Exposure to, in education is what it's all about. You learn what you've been taught. Um, you, you, you use what you've been taught because it becomes comfortable. So environmental health is really at the lowest point of the totem pole when it comes to what really should be in medical school training, nutrition being the most basic. And if that's a hurdle, and we know that there's a lot of pharma-driven funding that goes to medical schools and residencies, um, and that's a fact, then we really can understand why the system is something we shouldn't wait for. And that we should really even everyday people with no scientific background and even no socioeconomic means can really just learn very quickly 
um, from this book or from things I post on The Smart Human, which is my platform. Um, the Smart Human is just on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, but I post regularly on little nuggets of environmental health information so that people don't feel overwhelmed. It's humorous and self-deprecating. There's mental health information in there as well as just physical stuff. So really, it's just a matter of you, myself, other people just sharing good information that's not wacky or fringe. But, you know, as you mentioned, there's not always hard evidence. Um, and I think that relies on what we call the precautionary principle, which we discussed in the book, which says, you know, listen, if it makes reasonable sense to do this based on what we know about animal studies, perhaps, or other similar chemicals or exposures, then it would make sense to reduce this from your life. Um, it's not like there's going to be a $5 million study on whether or not, you know, soaking your tea bags, uh, you know, in tea, tea cup um, necessarily is going to cause you heart disease in 20 years if, it's, if you're getting exposed to the chemicals, the plastics in, in, a, in a tea bag case or something. I'm just giving an example. No one is doing specific research in these outcomes from 20 years from now. So we really just have to use the precautionary principle to make reasonable choices that are not costly and don't really require people to have a very strong science background. Gotcha, that makes sense. I think, yeah, what you're saying is, is very true because I think starting at grassroots and moving our way up is because changing the whole system of medicine, that's gonna take a while, right? But educating like citizens themselves to be able to make knowledgeable decisions because really, they, they don't have the resources available to make those knowledgeable decisions when they buy perfume or when they buy deodorant or when they even buy food. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I, I have always felt that the public is far smarter than we give them credit for, even when it comes to health and wellness, because, you know, even at the core, we have a gut feeling when what we're doing may be harmful. I mean, mothers, all, I'm biased in the sense that, you know, mothers tend to, I'm a mom, but you get a sense um, a very primal sense of protecting your young. Um, and I've sensed that independently of any educational, you know, instruction that you're always trying to figure out how to protect um, your young per se. So, you know, you think about the water that you feed them or, you know, when baby bottles um, had BPA, bisphenol A taken out of plastic in 2012, um, which was actually largely the work of my partner, Frederick von Saul, his research um, really, um, along with colleagues, really contributed to the removal of that chemical, which is an endocrine disruptor, um, from plastic baby bottles because of the way it could affect hormones in young children who are drinking their formula from a baby bottle that's plastic that had that, that chemical. So, you know, we have instincts, um, everyone does, not just moms, but we have instincts. And I think that when you take an instinct, then you add scientific information that's well referenced and reasonable and easy to understand, boom, it's like kismet, you know, and then people really start to see things differently. Right, absolutely. And so I watched your TED talk and I saw in the description some of the claims made in this talk like lack sufficient scientific evidence. And so to me, I looked at that with, like skeptically because I know that that doesn't necessarily mean what you said isn't backed by science or isn't backed by what you've seen in your clinic. So what are your thoughts on this disclaimer? So it's funny you say that. I think that they got more litigious over the years, TED Talks. And I think they have just a lot of good, well-paid lawyers. Um, but the fact of the matter is, almost every single person who is a major bench researcher that I work with looked at that, or if they even picked up on it, because that was a good pickup on your part, um, and was like, this is crazy. But it's in line with what we've been seeing over the years. It's consistent with this battle against um, you know, certain components of science that are trying to teach real truths over an industry that's really been, you know, exploding. I mean, the plastics industry, um, you know, the chemical industry, I mean, just to give you some more numbers, we have 90,000 chemicals um, available now. So since World War II, um, in the 1950s, all of these chemicals started exploding. Pesticides were created to protect troops overseas. We had Naugahyde and Rayon and Formica and Plexiglass um, and just literally thousands of chemicals. It was the chemical age. And those chemicals went into products that helped with food storage, things that were really quite helpful, believe it or not, because we wanted to reduce use of natural resources like wood and um, stainless steel and that and certain heavy, met, uh, you know, price, pricey metals. 
But the idea was that we had an explosion of really great, interesting science, but we never saw the downstream effects. And, you know, and now we're seeing how it's hard to clean up these plastics, that they don't degrade. Chemicals like the PFOS perfluoroalkyls are non-stick chemicals from DuPont, uh, among other companies, which, you know, was in the movie Dark Waters with Mark Ruffalo. That's a, a, a chemical group of thousands of chemicals that don't even break down. And so I guess, you know, the long and the short of it is that disclaimer to me was consistent with this sort of battle um, against sort of the powers that be um, chemical companies, industrial chemicals, because they were afraid that on some level they would be implicated with this kind of general talk on how chemicals affect human health. Um, there was nothing specific, no brands used, as you saw in the TED talk. It was super, you know, squeaky clean on purpose, and yet it was still labeled. So, you know, I, I don't take offense, I know the truth, but the idea was that people should be very, very leery of, of their resources and where they get their information. And, you know, we're hoping, Dr. Bamsal and I, having worked with some of the biggest leaders in environmental health, biologists, toxicologists, um, physicians, that we are getting the right information to the public um, and, you know, really making sure we don't uh, pass on bad information, which is our goal. Right. And so I want to get into glyphosate a little bit because that's super controversial. And, um, you know, I've looked into it a little bit and I've learned that the basic mechanisms by which it works is it disrupts an enzyme in the shikimate pathway. And by doing that, it becomes a sort of like antibiotic and it reduces the amount of amino acids in that. Am I getting that right? Well, I actually think you got it better than I would probably be able to explain it because each one of these chemicals out of the 90,000 glyphosate, which is a pesticide also known as Roundup, that's very popular, common. It's probably the, it is the world's leading herbicide or um, weed killer in the world. And it has an enormous number of health effects. Um, we've seen it in the news. We saw um, these, ma these major legal payouts um, to, um, uh, there was a, um, a landscaping um, worker at, at a school who worked at a school for many, many years who developed um, a type of lymphoma, or uh, I think it was a lymphoma, and he got paid $58 million. Of course, he was dying. But we now know that uh, Monsanto has been or will be paying out, I think Bayer now owns Monsanto, uh, millions and millions of dollars in um, in costs to you know for people who are, are dying from exposure to glyphosate. Now glyphosate or Roundup is bought at a big box store. I see it at the checkout counter, and it breaks my heart. I end up starting to you know give lectures at the checkout counter and probably have security called on me. But it's so important for people to understand that these are developed as neurotoxins, many of these pesticides. They're meant, you know, especially insecticides, they're meant to actually go and cause brain damage to fleas, ticks, um, you know, many of the living creatures. But in terms of the plant material, they do affect um, a whole pathway um, in the human body that can really generate harmful uh, problems. And so cancers are one of them, um, but they're also known as endocrine disruptors. So we know that there's glyphosate has effects on the, on the human endocrine system, like many other chemicals that are called endocrine disruptors, and, you know, affect hormones. Hormones are the signalers in the human body that help grow us, that make us, you know, have, you know, be able to have children. So fertility um, hormones, growth and development, thyroid hormone, insulin is a hormone for sugar processing. Um, we know in utero hormones create brains in a, in a fetus, um, you know, so there's just so many reasons why hormones, which are so sensitive and, and work at such a parts per million, parts per trillion level, so tiny, tiny, tiny amounts, these chemicals can, help, can disrupt or mimic many of those hormones. And so in short, glyphosate can do the same thing. In addition to cancers, it is considered a probable cancer. Um, under the uh, IARC, International uh, Agency for Research on Cancer. Um, actually, I believe it's a possible cancer and they're trying to move it to probable, if I'm correct. So, you know, and that's just an A, B, C, D listing, but essentially it's really not. Now it's being removed from the Mexican, uh, I, Mexico just removed it right. as an allowable pesticide. Europe is considering it. We know parks in Miami have all removed it from public parks, New, New York, um, city is actually um, considering removing it from all pu public parks. So this is a trend that I think is going to happen across the country. I think we're going to see the end of Roundup. 
um, and glyphosate across the US and maybe Europe. But what's problematic, again, back to that original issue, is that substitute chemicals are still being flushed into the system. A thousand new compounds a year are added to the US market. 15 new polymers are getting patented every week. Wow. So it's a hard thing to keep up with. And that's why the recommendations in non-toxic start with don't buy it to begin with. If you don't buy a lot of these products to begin with, you're not bringing them in your home, into your life, into the bodies of your body, into your children's bodies, your pets. Um, and so really a lot of it is very cost effective because you're just not buying stuff to begin with. If you're trying to live a healthier life, then you probably know that nutrition is at the core of human health. And so you're trying to find organic whole foods uh, without crappy ingredients like canola oils or a lot of sugar, then Thrive Market is for you. Now, I know by this point, if you've been listening, that I probably sound like a broken record, but it's for a good reason. Basically, these guys are a totally online, shipped right to your door, subscriptions-based service. And the reason that they stand out to me is because they're super affordable. How affordable, you might be asking yourself? They're about the price of a cup of coffee per month, around $5 per month, which really you make up for in how much you save throughout the year. And they only choose the best producers, the best brands for their products, meaning that you don't have to double check and spend hours looking at the nutrition facts to find ingredients that you can't even pronounce. Now the best part is it's completely risk-free you can cancel your subscription within 30 days. And also, if you use my link, you'll get a $24 in-store credit to use for any gift of your choosing. I know it's probably going to be a difficult question, but if, if so many new replacements are like constantly coming in, it's just this uphill battle that we're constantly fighting. How are we ever supposed to you know, know for sure that something isn't toxic? Well, I think that's the problem is you can only stay in your own lane. I'm not a toxicologist. I'm a physician. So I te teach my patients what to do. And we sometimes get blood testing and urine testing. And, you know, we, we try to figure out what each individual has in their body. But if I wanted to say um, pretty confidently, we're all loaded up with chemicals. It's just a matter of how well we can reduce them from our environment. We can't always fix the system. I have friends that are working on Capitol Hill, researchers, lawyers, they're doing their stuff very, very well, like environmental working group as a group. But I would say to us and people who might be watching this is we actually can reduce these chemical loads in our body. I'll give an example. Um, BPA or bisphenol A I mentioned earlier was taken out of plastic baby bottles in the US. That was the only thing they could get it out of. Meanwhile, it's in everything you can think of. It's on receipts. Uh, it seals the ink on receipts and currency, um, every receipt, believe it or not. Um, but it's also in the lining of canned foods and drinks. So literally every canned foods and drink, I mean, there's such a small percentage that don't have BPA, but then there's a question of whether there's a substitution that was designed. BPS is a, is a substitute they're using as well. But the idea is that it has a half-life, BPA, bisphenol A, of about six to eight hours, which means that 50% is reduced every six to eight hours in the human body. So by the time you get to one or two days, you've literally eliminated that particular BPA exposure. And there's studies from Harvard School of Public Health showing, particularly in one study who, you know, they gave 75 participants, um, you know, clean, healthy, non-packaged soup versus Progresso canned soup. And over the course of five days, they had the, the clean soup, and then they had a washout, and then they had the canned soup, a Progresso. They even late said the name. And then they measured urine, which is how we measure bisphenol A. And they had 1,100% drop in BPA between the fresh, uh, between the canned soup and the fresh soup. Uh, that's the only meal they switched out. And so what it shows is, is that some chemicals that we now know have very short half-lives. You can remove them from your life. If you change your lifestyle, say, you know, trying to get rid of canned foods and drinks um, and moving towards fresh or frozen, which you can transfer to glass to heat up. OK, so the idea is the book is filled. Our book is filled with reasonable solutions based on what we know about certain chemicals and certain high volume exposures. And that's what we want to do. We want to pick low hanging fruit and let people feel good knowing that what they're actually doing and making an effort for will have benefits hopefully down the line in terms of disease reduction. So there's this idea of a safe dose and what's considered to be a safe dose. Um, but for example, like if we know the mechanism of action of glyphosate, for example, like I, I don't understand really 
how anything can really be a safe dose if it's if it's a toxin, right? Like, what does that safe dose actually mean, and how do they test for that? So it depends on who's calling it a safe dose. So for if it's the Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA agencies through our government, as a public health measure, they never say zero because they have to, um, you know, somehow cover themselves for the fact that there's going to be um, some exposures to large populations. They they sometimes take an, they basically measure safe doses on based on a 200 pound male not a child whose body mass index is very, very small, not a pregnant woman who has obviously bloodstream to the placenta and to the fetus. So, you know, it all is in the eyes of the beholder, whoever calls it safe. So I'll give you an example that people may remember or understand is that lead. Lead has been taken out of the US market in leaded gasoline, in leaded paint in the 1970s. And that was, re the re it was done reasonably well and, and quite urgently because it was found by some very smart researchers that lead not only um, uh, reduced IQ levels, but it also increased aggressive behavior. And they've measured lead back in the day correlated to, um, you know, uh, incarceration in jails. So that, and this is fascinating stuff. And so when you actually read about lead, which we actually did a nice section on lead just to give people an understanding, lead at that time was considered unsafe at very, very high levels. I think it was like 60 parts per billion or million. I can't remember off the top of my head. But anyway, over the decades since that time, it's gone from like 60 to 50 to 40 to 30 due to all of the new um, worldwide research that's supporting the fact that this is really a toxic heavy metal for human brains. Um, it gets stored in the body and it can really affect children, especially during their developmental years for life in terms of their ability to process and cognition. Um, and that sets them up for, for disadvantage as we know. So um, now we know it's not just five parts per million or 10, it's no lead level is safe for human children. No, no lead level. And that's again, 60 years in the making um, at least. So, you know, the idea is that we may establish uh, an, a safe level now for glyphosate from the EPA, but most researchers would argue whatever that is, you know, you have to reduce that by tenfold at least. Um, because we know that they're over exaggerating the safe level. So the safe dose is based on one, how do they test for it being a 200 pound male? So a lot of things like for instance, even in radiation, which I know you're doing a lot of work with, they, they study a lot of things based on just an average 200 pound male model or right. physical body. Um, and a lot of times that's done in chemistry too, in terms of, you know, whether or not they move from animal studies to human studies. They're looking at body mass index of an adult person. Okay. Um, if they're doing those studies, I mean, that's if they do them or, or uh, you know, if EPA is, is, is right now they're doing, I think 10, they're required to do 10 chemicals a year to test, which was under the new Tosca legislation. And, you know, you figure if they're doing 10 a year and we're making a thousand a year, we're never going to catch up. It's almost pointless. But the point is, is that their old mechanisms of studying toxicity um, really don't hold up to modern day research. And we now know that many of the chemicals work at such low levels, like parts per million and parts per trillion, like hormones do, that no one's ever bothered to look at those low levels because we always just assume the dose makes the poison, that the more you're exposed to something, the more likely you're going to have a really terrible reaction. Like, Drinking alcohol is one really reasonable thing to wrap your head around. But it turns out these chemicals are harmful sometimes at very high doses, but also at very, very, very tiny, tiny doses that no one ever bothered to look at. And that's why they're called hormone mimickers, because that's how hormones work. Like accumulated exposure, for example, is something that is incredibly important to electromagnetic radiation. Because like, sure, you may put a phone up to your head for five minutes and we may not see anything if you don't do that for you know hours a day, right? If you just do it for that five minutes and you may not do it for a few months, like, okay, it may not be that bad in that moment. But if you do that every single day, what's considered to be a safe dose might not be a safe dose over the long term. Right. And lipstick is the same thing. So many lipsticks have a lot of chemicals like cadmium, mercury, and lead. And those are allowable. Any chemicals are allowed in cosmetics. But what's interesting is even, they, even if there's a very tiny amount of lead when it's tested, because a lot of the lead and mercury are used to help make the pigments bright. 
So even the fanciest, most expensive lipsticks could be the most toxic, believe it or not. And people think that if they pay more, it's safer, but that's absolutely not true. And there's a way to look up cosmetics, by the way, which we give in the book, you know, um, on ewg.org slash skin deep um, or their healthy living app, but we have other resources, but you can look up all your cosmetics. It's what I do with high school students. I toss these products at all the kids and they look them up and they figure out which products are safe and alternatives and they giggle and laugh. And it's just, it's really good empowerment, but lipstick. If you're licking off, licking off lipstick every day and it has a little bit of lead and there's no regulation on lead levels in makeup, then you're getting little doses of lead or mercury or cadmium every single day that you put that lipstick on. So it makes sense to look up that lipstick and see whether or not it's actually been considered safe or unsafe um, from a vetted resource, from people who actually do this and are not purchased or bought off by the cosmetic industry. And that's what we figured out, all the different resources that people can use that wouldn't be giving them bad information, that they could look up couches without flame retardants. You can look up makeup, you can look up cleaning products, you can do it yourself. We have a bunch of do-it-yourself um, cosmetic recipes, a lot of cleaning recipes. We have food and detox recipes for people who wanna make great shakes and um, drinks and foods that are filled with all of the fruits and vegetables. We know that detox the body. So we wanted people to have every aspect of doing this process, whether you buy it or you make it. And, um, you know, and just knowing these details is really quite important to empowerment. I'll definitely include those links, by the way, in, in the show notes for people. Um, so, okay, first, I really want to dig down on safe dose because like I, I, as we keep talking about it, I keep more questions keep coming up. So they're animal studies, but they're based off of a model of what a 200 pound male would react to the study or would react to the toxin? Well, it depends on who, which body is testing. Right. So there's the EPA, there's other, there's researchers that do research that maybe start with a different model. And I can't speak to every model for every chem, chemical, but in radiation, we know, and, and the work of Theodora and Deborah Davis was that, you know, we know that even radiation was tested back in the day off of a model that was a grown male. Um, and that had to do with the army and testing a lot of the chemicals, uh, or I should say the radiation based on exposures to soldiers. Um, but we know in terms of um, chemicals that they're tested and they're not typically tested at all by EPA, right? It's usually, if anything, voluntary by manufacturing, but more likely academics. That's when, when you start to look at the smaller creatures such as, you know, fetuses and, um, you know, pregnancy and in utero exposure and even toddlers, that by body mass index, they have less ability to break down chemicals. Their detox um, pathways are not matured enough to handle a lot of these adult exposures that we're getting, but they're also, they have such a variety, a limited variety of food in their diets to actually help battle exposure to these chemicals because green leafy vegetables, as an example, or uh, cruciferous vegetables have these really cool chemicals in them that are known to decrease the effects of environmental chemicals um, on many levels. And so that's what we want people to know is it's also what foods you choose, not just what you don't eat. It's what you do eat, what nutrients you get. Those also are really critical to battling exposures. Um, but I'll give you another example in drinking water. So in this country, we have 160,000 water treatment plants, which clean our water around the country, which pretty much cleans the water of about 75 or 80% of Americans water. The rest is well water, okay? But the water treatment plants in this country are only held to one law called the Safe Drinking Water Act from 1974 that still holds true in 2020, which is hard to believe again, that only watches, manages, and remediates 91 chemicals if, if you're exposed. So 91 chemicals, meaning some of the, you know, the chemicals that, um, oh, well, I don't know, from sewage, from air quality problems, from chemicals that land from the air into the streams and lakes and aquifers that go into our water treatment plants, coal ash, uh, sewage runoff I mentioned, fertilizer runoff, um, you know, feed lots from large animal production. All of this stuff can go into water that will eventually make its way into the treatment plants to be cleaned so that it goes out to us, right? 
The problem is, is that these, you know, units don't manage anything but 91 chemicals. So they're not even looking for any other chemicals but the 91, uh, which we have in our book tried to show people what they look for. And we have so many new chemicals that just don't make it through the infrastructure of these, that make it through these, the infrastructure. So it's literally going through the treatment plants right out, travels another maybe 20, 30 miles through PVC piping into our glass. And we call that clean water. By the way, it has chlorinated chemicals to reduce infection, which it should. And it has detergents that are allowable at a level, an MCL, maximum um, concentration. MCL is uh, maximum concentration um, limit. And those are the high levels that are allowable before it leaves. Now, who determines the MCL? The EPA. And what we consider safe may not be what they consider safe. What right. I recommend is people should always filter their water when it arrives at their house, at the point of use, right out of their spigot, out of their faucet, because that's where you have control as a consumer to remove all that junk that traveled with your water and all the chemicals and chlorine and, and anything that didn't get washed off at the treatment plant. So that's a big area for me. And we have a whole chapter on drinking water in the book. What would you recommend for a filter? So I think it also depends on people's costs and um, you know, if they're moving from apartment to apartment, if they're gonna be a college student one year and then switch off. You know, so you wanna make sure that you're mobile enough to move these filters around. But I gotta tell you, hands down, my recommendation is a reverse osmosis water filter with a carbon component. It has to have a carbon filter component. So most people use carbon filters in their, fit, in their pitcher, like a Zero Water or Brita or in their, um, refrigerator door usually has a carbon block filter or their faucet. Now those are okay. I want everyone to use something. But if you want to get more aggressive, you really want to think about a reverse osmosis, which is really like a dialysis machine, believe it or not. It's that aggressive. It takes off everything, viruses, bacteria, very small particulate contaminants um, that would otherwise go through all these other types of filters. And it's the most aggressive thing that we as consumers can buy on the market. Now, they're only 250 bucks, 250 to 300 bucks now. And I get mine out of California, 100% of the parts are made in California, which you wanna definitely ask them about. You wanna know that they're vetted. Um, we got ours off of Consumer Reports listing, but it was no more than, I guess, 500 at the time, 14 years ago, and now they're down to 250. I give them as wedding gifts, believe it or not. And, um, and they cost about 100 and you ship to your house in a big box and then a plumber puts it in for 150 bucks for one hour. That's it, it's all it takes. And then it's about $40 a year to change out the components, the cartridges. Um, and that's your system. And then you carry your water in glass and stainless steel, nothing that says BPA free, no plastics. Avoid plastics wherever you can. And that's a great water system as you move forward. And really, if you move, you can just have some plumber take it out and then put it back in wherever you're moving to. We had our first one last uh, 14 years. Perfect. And so to shift away from this and to talk about um, practically how people are really exposed to all of these different things, because something that I think is kind of rare, correct me if I'm wrong, is um, rarely are these chemical studied in combination. Like there are very few studies that do, okay, let's look at pesticides and electromagnetic radiation, and let's look at this. And, and medications, right, and medications, and, yes, which are right. also chemicals. We have a whole chapter on medications to think about, yeah. Right, so as I was writing my short ebook, Return to Human, I, I started to learn all of that. It's like, you know, maybe some conventional doctors who don't have the knowledge of these toxins may say, oh, you know, like that's just like pseudoscience that they affect you so much. Like it's not, it's just genetics, right? But they're not looking at so many of these other things. And I really think that's why a holistic model like what you do is super important because really we are, nature doesn't work in isolation and we don't work in isolation. And if you look at one little part, it's going to affect other parts of the body. So all of these things that we have in our modern day that we don't even really turn up, turn an eye to anymore. Like we don't even look at them as being potentially harmful. So what happens with that is if it's chronic, it turns into inflammation. So could you talk a little bit more about inflammation and why that's a bad thing? Yeah, inflammation is the body's way of saying, I'm pissed. 
And you know, the thing is, is that we've been evolving for over 4.5 million years. And we've had over 90,000 chemicals introduced into the human body, into the lives of humans, I should say modern day living just in the last 200 years. It's a blink. So to think that the human body, which has evolved for 4.5 million years to have detoxability and all this other stuff can handle 90,000 new chemicals is why I'm seeing so many people sick. I mean, you know, younger and younger people with diseases that they shouldn't have, that are usually old person's diseases, testicular cancer, thyroid conditions. I can't tell you how many young women and young men actually now that I'm managing with thyroid conditions, not so much thyroid cancer, which is also on the rise in young people, but thyroid conditions. They're on medicines their mothers are on. Um, and so, you know, I want people to really, and autoimmune diseases, which I'm a rheumatologist, so I deal with lupus and rheumatoid and, and MS and Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and everything autoimmune that you could think of. Why are we in this position? Well, it's because our bodies just haven't had time to acclimate um, to these crazy compounds that they see. And then when you take one compound and you add it to other compounds and other compounds and you add a little stress and this and that, and you're starting to see that the body can't deal with it. Um, another aspect that people don't talk much about, certainly in med schools, um, but I'm sure you're aware of, Jorge, is the gut microbiome. And the microbiomes throughout the body that are trillions of bacteria and viruses and molds and yeast living together happily in a healthy system. And what happens with a lot of these environmental chemicals, particularly in the gut, is that, which the gut is only a 24 foot long tube, okay? That's all it is. The gut is a tube from mouth all the way to your bum. And it's a tube, but on that tube is about, I don't know, a couple hundred trillion uh, of these micros microscopic bacteria that live with us and help our bodies manage nutrients and um, a whole bunch of, uh, of, you know, manage our immune system. Our biggest immune system is our gut. And what these chemicals do and stress does and chlorinated chemicals in drinking water and pesticides in our food and all these food coloring and additives do is they knock off the good guys. And when you knock off the good guys, you get this crazy imbalance and then the immune system fails and we either have an autoimmune disease or food allergies or any number of things that are really skyrocketing. When I was a kid, you could bring in cupcakes to your kid's you know, birthday party. I remember it. And now you can't bring a thing into school with my kids because there is so much food allergy. And a lot of that has to do with the gut microbiome being altered and our environment being altered so dramatically that our body doesn't even know what to react to. So it reacts to a lot of stuff. Right. I remember when I was going to elementary school, we still allowed people to bring in food for their birthdays. And then you just a few the years. Because you're young. Yes. So. Yes. I just made the cutoff. I just made the cutoff. So one piece of it is the microbiome, right? That there are these things like glyphosate, which could potentially be um, working as antibiotics and destroying some of those good bacteria, as well as some of those bad bacteria. And I think we've really started to create a germ phobic society where we think that all viruses, all bacteria, all fungus, they're, they're bad, right? And we need to sterilize everything. It's marketing. It's the cleaning industry, right. the chemical industry of marketing, cleaner homes, antibacterial, everything. When in fact, antibacterials and antibiotics are just going to create resistance, meaning when you actually need a good antibiotic to help you in the hospital, your body won't respond and use that properly because it's already been exposed to it and all those bugs have already mutated. So what we're creating is, I mean, there's literally tile sealant that's marketed with antibiotics infused into the tile. What could be more dumb than walking around in an antibiotic floors? Because then when you actually need an antibiotic for some surgery or pregnancy or something that runs amok, you're not even gonna to respond to it in any positive way because your body's already seen that antibiotic and those bacteria aren't responding to it. So, you know, we have long-term issues from marketing that um, I just recently saw um, a lot of advertising because of COVID. Now, mind you, COVID is serious. We know it's serious, but there's a difference between disinfection and cleaning. And the cleaning products that you can look up on ewg.org um, for their cleaning products, toxicity listings, and uh, safe products, is very different than the disinfection products that are really meant to kill bacteria. 
And those need to be used very judiciously in areas of your home or your school or wherever you're using it, but in a way that makes you conscious where it's being used versus cleaning, which really just kind of breaks up bacteria and knocks it out and picks it up and disposes it. Um, because again, the toxicity level differs. We talk about it in the book. We have a whole chapter on cleaning products and we got in COVID information before it went to press. So we know that that's still active and, and very um, pertinent. Um, but yeah, I think that when we, when we get into a world of, of fear and science is not taken into account, but fear is overriding, um, I think that's when we get into problems. And you know, the fear of not having a beautiful lawn uh, when we know lawn care is toxic, most of it is all pesticides, that green thumb, truck, whatever it is, we got to think about this because those chemicals get brought into your home, your animals and pets and kids are running around in pesticides. Um, and then you bring it into the home and to think that that does not have a chronic effect on them or your health or your microbiome is kind of silly. So it's just a matter of matter of having a perspective. I never had this perspective. This is all new to me back eight years ago. So I'm not here to judge. I'm one of you guys. I'm just saying you don't have to spend eight years researching it. Here you go. Um, but I'm on a journey. My hair is colored. So, you know, um, these are things that come slowly and, and you got to just take your time and it's a journey and do the best you can little by little. Right. So number one would be microbiome health. And then number two, you talked a little bit about hormonal health and how things could be endocrine disruptors. How exactly would that impact our immune system? Well, you know, the endocrine system and the, and, the, uh, and the immune system are, again, as you mentioned, not silos. Our body sees things as a whole and they interconnect, they talk to each other. So just because something is a hormone disruptor doesn't mean it also does not have effects on the um, immune system. And so we have a lot of inflammation as a general rule that comes from environmental chemicals. These have been well studied. Uh, interleukin-6, interleukin-17, IL-1, um, the inflammasomes. These are all components of what we call the innate immune system, which is the most primitive part of our entire immune system. And then it connects with the humoral immune system, which creates the antibodies, things that are exposed to things and you get memory cells. And the long and the short of it is, just not to make it too complicated, is that our immune system um, gets irritated by chemicals it doesn't understand or know or hasn't seen before. And so we know, for instance, with COVID, that the more comorbidities, the chronic health conditions you have, the more likely you're going to have a worse response to that infection. In other words, everyone can get COVID. We've seen that. Anyone can get it. The question is who responds worse towards it, needs oxygen or ventilation or even dies. And we now know with pretty solid evidence worldwide that the more chronic health conditions you already have at baseline, the more you're at risk for the worst outcomes. And that includes autoimmune disease, blood pressure issues, um, heart disease, particularly um, diabetes that's uncontrolled, and obesity. Now, it turns out that all those conditions are influenced by chemicals. The endocrine system messes with the hormones that it helps to create those chronic conditions. As I mentioned, insulin is a hormone. And we know that environmental chemicals affect insulin, and that can contribute to early diabetes and diabetes, along with poor diet, obviously. But a contributor, a big contributor is chemicals. So if you can tie the dots together, which we've now done and people have done worldwide, you can see that environment affects inflammation and increases your baseline amount of inflammation, which predisposes you to a worse outcome. And so the, the punchline is, let's get healthier. Let's use this time to really get our stuff in order without cursing and really think about, you know, how do we eat healthier and cleaner without costing us an arm and a leg? Well, frozen organic foods are really cost, cost effective. That's they maintain cool. all their nutrient value because they're flash frozen. So why not go with flash frozen organic, which means less pesticides and chemicals and genetically modified components and transfer it to a glass container when you're heating it up. That way you don't have to get fresh food, which often doesn't even have great nutrient value because it's traveled for six months or it was frozen for six months. So the idea is there are many, many, many ways, and we give plenty of these options, I promise you, in ways to get your health in order, especially now, without spending a ton of money or needing to know anything about science particularly, and that we should maybe consider this a real moment in time for us to learn this and take care of it and teach our children um, some of these habits. 
Definitely. And I, I think that this whole situation has really revealed how unhealthy people have become. And as the data started to roll out, and I think it's 94% of those who died had at least one comorbidity from, from COVID. And so- And as they had more comorbidities, uh, linked, the, I mean, the risk went up. It was almost linear. Like the more what, zero, one, two, three comorbidities in terms of risk went right up the same way. And yeah, I mean, I think we were all panicked in the very beginning. I thought, oh my God, wouldn't it be crazy if all the healthiest people died first? The whole gig would be up, my whole career, everything that I've been talking about, all the science would be up. But it turned out, which makes sense, that people with more conditions, more health, unhealthy conditions, um, you know, tended to get sicker. And unfortunately, there's also health disparity among minorities and people who may not have access to clean food or people who are downstream from factories and they have no choice but to stay there because they don't have money to move. And yet they're getting downstream air quality that's horrendous or carcinogenic. So we have a lot of things that were revealed with this pandemic and we can't change all of them, but we can certainly try, I'm hoping, on the individual level of what you put in on and around your body. Right. And as I started to do research for my ebook, I started to tell my friends this. I started to be like, you know, we really need to just be healthier. Like, I, like that's really the solution. Obviously, it's a difficult solution. It's easier said than done. Um, but that's, I, I think that's where the solution lies. And that's where our focus should be rather than, you know, telling people that um, they're, they don't have control when it comes to their health. Um, and they just looked at me like funny and they didn't really, they didn't really get it because at that time I couldn't really articulate it very well. But yeah. as you're saying, all these things that we're learning now about how metabolic health is tied to immune health, how, you know, your mental health is tied to your immune health, how the microbiome is that tied brain to immune connection, health. right? You're absolutely right. The gut brain connection. We know that the brain um, only maintains about 25% of serotonin, which is our feel good neurotransmitter, but 75% of serotonin is in the gut. And so when you can keep your gut healthier with more bacteria, probiotics, probiotic foods, you know, things that feed the gut like fresh green vegetables, pesticide free foods, you're really bolstering your brain through your gut. It's that gut brain connection. And there's so many studies that support this. And you're absolutely right. It's a hard thing to sell people, especially when you're stressed. People are economically challenged right now. People are lonely. People, you know, really don't have social, um, you know, support many people. But, you know, the idea is you don't want to just eat a bag of chips in the, in the closet. You're going to end up putting yourself at greater risk when we get through this. We, we will get through this. It's going to be a hard, hard time for the next several months, but we will get through it just like 1918 pandemic. But we may have more in the future. And there's a prediction that we may have more in the future, and that may be due to climate change as well, and deforestation worldwide and some other issues. But the idea is, and pollution, of course, but the idea is you got to be able to do it on an individual level. What you bring into your home in terms of air quality and, you know, fragrance and sprays and air fresheners and laundry detergents and carpet powders and so much junk that we bring into our home that literally makes its way into our bloodstream and into our breast milk and into our urine. And if we just, you know, put on the brakes and say, really, is this necessary? You can start unloading this stuff from your body. Yeah, something that I've come to learn is that really environmental health is human health. And sure, the people that are most well off might be able to offset the fact that our planet is really dying as we speak. I mean, in the past few decades, over 50% of all species have gone extinct and it's, it, it keeps going that way. Um, so I think really what, you, what you're talking about is one consumer at a time, you know, leading the market, trying to shift the market away from buying things like Roundup, for example, just maybe stop buying Roundup and that may have, you know, potentially good consequences. Yeah, moving the market by purchasing. I mean, this is another reason why I did that TED talk and why I try to get into high schools and, and colleges um, because, you know, the, the, the dollar is very powerful. And if for nothing else, it's not altruism that manufacturer is next necessarily going to be like, hey, let's go green and let's save the planet. They're really looking at, you know, income in terms of who's buying their products. And that's why there's been a whole clean beauty, you know, movement. Um, we now know there are organic tampons, which, you know, feminine care products are some of the most chemically laden chemicals you can put inside your body. And we're talking young women over the course of 40 years of menstruation. We have to start really thinking about exposures, even if it makes us a little uncomfortable. We have to think about that. But purchasing power totally means something. And the next generation, your generation, 
really is going to be in charge of this because you guys need to demand better for your bodies because no one else is watching you but you. And I think that's really what's so empowering is that so many young people want to learn this kind of information. They're body aware, they're, they're conscious, they, um, you know, they know how to use apps and websites really um, carefully and powerfully. They also may have kids one day like yourself. You may vote one day, you know, it's, it's like you really have a lot of power that, um, that I think can be really harnessed in terms of human health to set you guys up for safer, you know, lives down the line. It's true. Yeah, and it's, it's crunch time right now. We need to start innovating solutions right now, or it, it might honestly be like have some devastating impacts that we can't reverse very soon. So speaking of solutions, what are some of the just really easy things that you think are the most top like toxic offenders in people's lives right now? All right, I'll give you like a top five list. Number one, don't buy junk. Don't buy chemicals that are commercial on the shelves if you don't need it. Don't buy air fresheners. Don't buy carpet powders. Avoid all these things with fragrance or perfume as we talked about earlier because we just don't need them. Um, and in fact, you can create, as I say in the book, many cleaning products with just white vinegar and essential oils that are 100% organic, which you have to just make sure of. Um, and, you know, sea salt for scrubbing and borax and, and Castile soap. Um, you know, there's almost nothing you can't clean with all of that and nothing else. Um, I think people should really watch in terms of lawn care, decide just to mow your lawn short. You really don't need to keep up with the Joneses and yet we track in a lot of those pesticides and we keep them in business by keeping these lawn services coming to our home. Um, I think everyone should have a filtered drinking water system. Um, whether it's a carbon pitcher, if that's where you're at right now, financially and locally where you're, you know, you are, I think that's okay. But consider the reverse osmosis, but get it from a vetted system, uh, a vetted company. And we talk about that in the book, if you really need a little, um, you know, guidance for that. Um, think about medications. You know, I don't tell anyone to go off medications. That's personal and certainly between you and your doctor. But it's nice for you to understand how medications work how many of them are overprescribed, you know, for things that you can have very safe alternatives to. And we talk about that in the book. We don't want anyone to take away any medicines um, without really discussing with your physician, but know that there are alternatives and um, that are well vetted. And then I would also say with radiation, especially what you're working on, Jorge, is really think about radiation in terms of its exposure to your body. Don't carry a cell phone in your bra because there's known, um, lesions or benign tumors that have been found underneath um, the antenna portion, particularly in women who carry them in their bras. Um, you don't want to carry your cell phones in your front pocket where you have your testicles and sperm and all that and all these growing, you know, um, uh, body parts. My sons, uh, they carry them in their pocket and they know very well to turn on airplane mode. Um, so you want to just get these habits, you know, started where they do them on their own. They don't have to be yelled at for it. I just checked my son's uh, phone this morning when I woke him up for school and sure enough, it was on airplane mode. So he's at a point where he does it without me even yelling at him, which is a beautiful feeling and it took a while. Um, but we also don't want to, um, you know, put our laptops on our lap too, because that's more, that's radiation. It's signaling, it's an antenna and that's why often you'll feel the heat. But you don't always have to feel the heat for radiation, especially with EMF radiation, but for laptops, it's, it's definitely uh, apparent. But that's the kind of stuff you wanna think about, is reducing radiation, reducing chemicals, but also stress. Reduce stress in your life as best you can control. Turn off the news, get away from toxic people. You know, do breathing exercises, go for nature, exercise. Aerobic exercise is the most incredible thing for your brain, but also for reducing chemicals as well. And get good sleep because we clear chemicals around the brain at night while we sleep. It's not just about memory and cognition and feeling rested. It actually is a great way to reduce those chemicals while we sleep. So that's just a start. And I give a bunch more, but I wanted people to see that it's not complicated and that anyone can do this. And, um, and if not, you can also follow, again, The Smart Human, The Smart Human, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and thesmarthuman.com for a whole bunch of other podcasts and articles and interesting topics. Um, we talk about vaping in the book. We talk about um, soccer turf. You're an athlete, Jorge. 
So we talk about um, you know, how to handle soccer turf, which is mostly synthetic with benzene, tire crumb, and lead in the leaves that are fake. How do you handle that when you have ch children that want to be on a soccer field or a lacrosse turf? And I go into that and the science behind it. So you know, we can live in modern day world, but we just have to be smart. That was very comprehensive. So the final thing that I want to touch on is the fact that the most important demographic really is children, toddlers, adolescents, and the fact that, you know, they're also being exposed to this, but it may be even worse for them and more detrimental to their health because they're developing, right? And so possible um, things that could affect their development could have profound consequences years down the line. So yeah, all of these things that you're talking about, they're pretty simple. I mean, people can really start today, like with, with all of the things that you're talking about, improving sleep, stress, and um, yeah, that's, that's the way to go. Yeah, it's not that complicated. Almost when you hear it, you're like, oh yeah, you know, but we want to move ourselves back to 4 million years ago. You know, we don't want to get eaten by a rhinoceros, but we want to really think about what did we live with and thrive with that made our genetics at that time hardier um, to manage the world around us back then, it was really the fact that we had clean water, clean air, we took berries and off of the trees so they were at their highest nutrient value. Um, you know, of course things are different in this world, we can't do everything like a cave person, but you know, the idea is there's some things to learn from about going back and keeping it simple. And I think most people may have learned through this COVID time um, that really what are you prioritizing? relationships that matter, um, you know, quality food, getting quiet time, maybe going for walks, you know, these pets, you know, adopting a pet, you know, these are the types of things that I think make us more human um, and make us less unhealthy. And um, yeah, those vulnerable periods of exposure are critical, you know, in utero exposure is super critical. Uh, it's not mom and dad's fault. It's just the fact that many of these industrial chemicals cross the placenta. They're not protected. The fetus is not protected. We know this, um, even from a 2005 study that showed that when they tested the cord blood of a newborn, right when the baby was born, there was over 200 um, industrial chemicals in the cord blood of 10 random babies. And that was in 2005. So, you know, we're all kind of being born polluted. What we have to do is consider what what to do if you can to clean out your body before you get pregnant, what you can do while you're pregnant if you didn't get a handle on it beforehand, and then what you can do after giving birth and all of the beneficial things you can do in terms of, um, you know, during breastfeeding and also with what you feed and, and uh, give your children for water. So there's always a chance to intervene. No one's to blame. There's no regrets here or else I'd be in big trouble here. But we just got to do the best we can moving forward. And I think that's the message to share with others as well. Wow. Well, this has been an amazing conversation, right? I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I do have some last few rapid fire questions at the end. Sure. So <clears throat> number one, what is the one aspect of health which you have found has the greatest impact on someone's health? Um, I would say food and water quality, biggest issue, because we just consume it so much and so rapidly and all the time for our whole lives. If we can get that right, or at least better, I think people will see a lot less health conditions that I see every day in the office. Absolutely. And number two, what is the driving force behind your practice and the motivation to, you know, keep on seeing clients and educating people? Um, I'm pissed. I'm pissed as a doctor. I'm 47. I'm in medicine and I'm just beside myself that we're not teaching patients and consumers and other doctors, you know, what, what the science shows internationally about how diet, nutrition, air quality, cosmetics do to the human body. I think if we could spend more time on prevention we would see far more time spent on treatment that was unnecessary if we could get to it first. So, um, you know, I'm motivated. I, you know, I have a day job. I love my practice more than anything. I love my patients, but this is the work I feel like is a legacy that will make my heart full that I have been on this planet and did something with my life um, other than, you know, my career and my family. I want to have something that's um, that does something for the population and makes people less ill. 
Well, you just answered the last question also in that, uh, in what does leaving a legacy mean to you and what message do you want to leave behind? Yeah, I want people, especially young people, I mean, I speak to everybody, every age group, but I have found a particular love of young people um, in terms of their embracing of this kind of information. They, they see it, they know it, they know the gig is up. And I'm just and truly inspired by what I'm hearing from high school students I teach and college students and all these programs like your program. I just had a med school student and her boyfriend um, are doing a podcast and I did an hour with them and they're, they have a huge following too. I mean, so it, it's to me, it's like young people are saying enough's enough and you're inspiring me to help you and other people to help you guys find a path to what you're looking for. And it's just, I, you know, it's heart, it, it makes me heart warmed because, um, you know, I find it not as warm and exciting with my own colleagues, which is kind of sad, but I find that young people are getting it and they're embracing good science, not wacky, and they're really looking for the truth. And I love that. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time again. Uh, where can people go and connect with you and the Smart Human, your website and educational platforms? Well, I think I already yapped about that, but I'll tell you, I, I practice in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, so people can come see me for a visit if they want to. I see all ages, all ailments. It doesn't have to be just rheumatology. I'm seeing migraines and stress and children and all that stuff. So everything is open game for what, what I can teach. Um, but I also do telemedicine if people um, aren't local. Um, that's the big thing now, of course. And then in terms of any education, I love people to follow on Instagram. Um, and Twitter and Facebook, or I don't do as much Twitter, but um, those feeds are really what I work on all the time to create nice messages that are edited over and over again to make it right with great articles and bulleted information for people on the go. And then of course, I figure, you know, this is eight years of work put into the most simplistic form I can think of. And it's uh, on Amazon, it's on, I think Barnes and Noble, uh, but you can go to the smarthuman.com to find the link for independent booksellers so that they can get um, payment as well. We shouldn't have everything going all to one seller, right? Um, so the smarthuman.com is the landing page for the book, but this book to me is um, all you need to know to get started and nothing in terms of stress um, or judgment. So please consider diving in at your own pace. Um, but I think that's going to be something that helps people get over the fear and the overwhelming topic that it is and makes it humorous and interesting and fun. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Cohen. My pleasure, Jorge. Good luck to you and everything you're doing.